good to see you tonight and certainly I count it a privilege to be here once again. Every service has been this way throughout the week. I know Brother J.R. knows how to really brag and encourage and he's done that for me this week. But regardless of what he said, I want to tell you the, the joy has been on our part. Darlene and I have rejoiced and been benefited so much being able to come together and be really lifted up by your attitudes. Congregation here, I said from the very earliest uh, Sunday afternoon, I'd already determined that the spirit was so positive and, and so good in this congregation. I could witness how you speak and deal one with another with love. And then each of the services, the songs have always been so uplifting, led so well and, and participated throughout the congregation. Prayers have been uplifting. And the way you've listened, I've seen people who take the Bibles out and read right along, and your words have certainly been encouraging. And on top of that, there have been several who have had us uh, sit at the table with you. You've provided hospitality with good meals for us, and we appreciate that so much. And as he said, it's been our privilege also to be in the home with J.R. and Sue. Before we ever came this week, we already knew them and already felt so warm and look forward to the time of being with them but really to stay in the home you really get to know somebody and it's just in strengthen our feeling of love for them and certainly what a pleasure it's been and they've put us up and put up with us and so you know we thank you Sue and JR so much Lord willing if you're down in Orlando I hope you'll call on us let us know you're here and even if we not see you again before that final day, I hope you'll keep us in your prayers. And I hope one day we all stand around the great throne of God, praising him throughout eternity. Our lesson tonight is one that I'd have to say is uh, I look forward to speaking. I, I take a passage from Isaiah chapter 40 and the last verse, verse 31, which I find a lot of people have memorized. In fact, if you've ever say had a list of verses maybe to memorize, you probably found this one on that list. And if, even if not memorized it, you've certainly heard it and found some comfort in it. Where the prophet Isaiah said, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What an encouraging passage that God cares for those who wait on him. And there is strength and assistance that is given. How many times do we really, though, know what's behind this passage? What, it shouldn't stand by itself. Really, any other verse of the Bible, we keep telling people, you need to read the context. So in what context is it that the prophet here gives this message of comfort and of confidence that God will provide and bless those who wait on him? Isaiah, indeed, was a prophet of the highest order, as we've been speaking already through the last couple of nights. He spoke at a time, though, where much of his prophecy was reproof, was a call to repentance. It wasn't always, the Lord's going to take care of you. In fact, as you know, there were many times where Isaiah spoke about how that there would be devastation, how that, indeed, the Lord in his wrath would would be so disappointed in his people that he promised that they would be taken away even into captivity and we know it happened. In fact, in our lesson last night, those of you who were here, we studied from chapter 5, first of all, how God described it as Israel as, as a vineyard that God had planted and provided the very best. He chose a special ground and he prepared the, the soil and planted a choice vine expecting good grapes. Built a tower in the midst of it and a wine press ready for good fruit. But instead, wild grapes had come up. And there were six woes that we looked at in chapter 5. And with that, then turning back even as you start the prophecy, chapter 1, where Isaiah said, even an ox or a donkey are more appreciative of the one who feeds them than the children of Israel were toward God who had blessed them so. The probing question that God would ask of that vineyard, what more could I have done? 
What more? Can you blame the God of heaven for the Israel not really being loyal and faithful to him throughout? And of course, we know the answer to that is that it, God did everything and even more so and does for us as well today. But how many are they who simply reject and ignore what God has done? Israel had a choice, and so do we. And because of that choice, there were times where Israel turned away from God. And Isaiah, like other prophets, really were messengers to the people who lived then. Sometimes in a class, we may ask the class, how would you define a prophet? You know, the first answer usually is, oh, they always foretold. Well, it is true that prophets did foretell. In fact, we pointed out how Isaiah is sometimes called the Messianic prophet. For there are some 60 prophecies from the book of Isaiah that are quoted in the New Testament. He foretold of what would later come. But like other prophets, the message first and foremost was to the people who first heard it. You see, in, as in chapter 5, he said of them that they had turned the good to evil. They, they reversed moral distinctions. They called the sweet bitter and bitter sweet. They had turned darkness to light and light to darkness. A prophet was a spokesman for God. You might say they were like preachers. They spoke to the people, repent, turn back. You're following vanity. In fact, as you follow idols and become like the nations, the heathens of, uh, who live near you or about you, as you turn away from God, you're only going to bring upon you destruction and devastation. And that's really what happened. It was in the midst of that, though, when they would say, if you do not repent, God will bring about trouble. But God will always remember his promise made to Abraham that of his seed and through his lineage he would raise up one through whom he would bless all families of the earth. And it's out of that that the prophecies of the future come. Either repent or here's what's going to happen. You may not be blessed. You may suffer reproof from God. But there will be a remnant always. There will always be some who are holy and will keep God's will and they are the ones who will be blessed and through whom the Messiah would come. And we know that's really what happened. Jesus was born of the lineage of Abraham, of the lineage of David, of the tribe of Judah, just as had been promised. God's word was fulfilled. In Isaiah chapter 40, though, where we've had a lot of messages, if you've read through the book up to this point in time, where the sovereignty of God is, is certainly declared and, and the promises, the warnings are also stated over and over in various ways. Chapters 40 through 49 is a section in Isaiah where the Lord God of heaven is compared to idols. How would you compare the true God of heaven to idols? And in the very first chapter of this section where he's comparing God to idols, he really says, in effect, there will be comfort. The chapter, someone says, opens with the words comfort and closes with hope. And because of that, the reason you might trust in the Lord that there will be comfort, he says, behold the Lord God. In fact, look at Isaiah chapter 40 and in verse 9, where he says, O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountains, O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. <laughs> lift it up. Be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold, your God. Shout it. This is something that you can take confidence in who God is. In fact, in verses 10 and 11, he says, Behold, the Lord God shall come with strong hand, and, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. With strong arm and hand, whatever is the purpose of God, it will occur. What God has promised and purpose will take place, for he is one with strength. And yet, though he is one with strength, verse 11 describes him as one who is gentle, as a shepherd. Verse 11 says he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. You know, the shepherd, we're probably not as common in this country with shepherds, but, 
but certainly in Palestine and, and the places where God's people were being with flocks of sheep was very, very common. And they understood the, the imagery of a shepherd. And, and certainly when there's maybe danger that comes or there may be wolves or wild animals coming, he would gather the little lambs up. Or maybe a time of storm and the shepherd may even carry them in his arms and protect them. So while God is strong with strong arm and strong hand and he will carry out his purpose even if it meant to, to defeat strong enemies, he's also gentle and he cares for his own. So in effect, shout this, let it be known who is God. Well, in the next verse, 12, he says, if you don't believe in, in the fact of his strength and of his gentleness, then take a look at what God can do and has done. He's measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. He's measured heaven with a span and, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure. Weighed the mountains and scales and, and the hills in a balance. If you look at that verse and think about it for a moment, that he, he's measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. You ever thought about what that includes? You know, as though the imagery, we would say, you know, here's the hand. But God's hand, how large it has to be. We live in Orlando. About 50 miles to the east, we, we come to the Atlantic Ocean, and it's a vast ocean. We've flown over it going to England and times past and Italy and some nine to ten hours with a plane flying at probably somewhere between four to five hundred miles an hour. And take that long. It's a vast bit of water, right? Maybe you've done the same. Or on the west coast, there's the Pacific Ocean, and we've flown to Australia and back three different times. Even larger, it seems. It takes some 15 or 16 hours then to, to get to Australia from, from Los Angeles. Fast. It's some 71% of this earth is covered with waters. And yet, in the hollow of his hand. I guess I really got impressed. I, I had flown, as I said, over the Atlantic and over the Pacific. Do you remember a couple of years ago when the Malaysian jet, number flight 370, disappeared? And finally they began to say, well, you know, it's probably come back around and landed in the Indian Ocean. And there was a vast amount of searching done, trying to find that airliner. And Yet even to this day, they haven't found it. But that's when I became impressed. The Indian Ocean. What a vast body of water it is. And God holds them in the hollow of his hand. Not only that, the scripture says he's measured heaven with a span. The span being like from the end of your thumb to the tip end of your little finger. God's measured the heaven with a span. Even scientists tell us that the earth and its distance from the sun, that if we were any closer to the sun, we would burn up. If we were any farther apart, we'd freeze. God measured it and placed it exactly in the right spot. God is the one who had the power and the strength to do that. In fact, it says he's calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains and scales and and the hills in a balance. Can you imagine? You know, this is Harry Arlene. I've been driving around with Brother J.R. And all of a sudden we come to a big tall hill. And he said, wow, we thought most of Indiana was flat and, and plain. But, but there's some hills here, right? But you don't have to go very far. We talk about the mountains, say the Smoky Mountains, or to the west, the Rocky Mountains, and others. And, and it all balances out. And God has measured it. He knows the difference between the dust of the earth and the waters. And there's the balance. In fact, the, the Lord knows exactly because he is the one who created it. As the 24 elders recorded in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, around the throne of God would say, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and, and by your will they, they exist and were created. God the Creator. Shout it from the highest mountain. Behold your God. 
Well, who, who directed him in this? That's what the next verse says in verse 13. Who's directed the Spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has taught him? How did he know how to do all of this? Did someone come and teach him? Verse 14, with whom did he take counsel and who instructed him and, and who taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and, and showed him the way of understanding? Could any man do that? Who of us could do that? Makes me think, you may be familiar with the passage in Job where the scripture, the scripture says in Job 38, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Now if you're Job standing here and you're getting this question, listen. God is saying, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. You can see the mockery there. What man could know that? Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, when I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors when I said, this far you may come, but no farther. And here your proud waves must stop. If you've ever been to the coast, aren't you glad that there's a time where the ocean stops? God set the bars. He set the doors, he says here. There's a limit to it. Oh, yes, we hear stories about the tsunami that because maybe there's been an earthquake in the midst of the sea somewhere and the waves do cross over the door, so to speak. And not long ago, Indonesia had several thousand who were killed as the water swept. But what if that were a common thing? What if when you go to the beach, if you do, and, and, and you see the tide come and go, but, but you don't ever know, maybe while you're there, all of a sudden it just comes. It doesn't, though, does it? You can trust. You know that it will stop. And God is saying to Job, who taught me to do that? Were you there? You know, who, who did this? And the scripture really is saying it's by God. God who had the wisdom and the knowledge to make it so. It is by the power of Almighty God that he created the heavens and the earth. In fact, you go on in chapter 40 and in verse 15, he says, Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales. Look. He lifts up the isles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn. Nor its beast sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing. And they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. Wow. Nations are like a drop in a bucket. You know, we've done some pretty great things, haven't we? Our generation of time can brag a little bit. Aren't we smart? Haven't we sent someone to the moon, walk on the moon and come back? Can you imagine? You know, I'm sure in this audience, none of us would be able to do that, but we can say, boy, human. We live amidst of people who are that smart and that creative and we've, we've developed. And you know what? Even right now, around our earth flies the International Space, Space Station about 200 miles above us. What a feat. It's beyond what I could do. And maybe you would say the same. But to God, it's like a drop in a bucket. And overwhelming. The things that man thinks are great are nothing but God. What man can do is only because of what God has provided. Man cannot do anything. He cannot make anything from nothing. From nothing, nothing comes. But only from what God has provided has man been able to take and develop and do these great things. But they are as nothing without God. Can you not begin to see where therefore God would say, to whom will you compare me? You who would worship idols, to whom would you compare me? Verse 18. To whom then would you liken God or, or what likeness will you compare to him? 
And that same question is repeated in verse 25, where it says, To whom then will you liken me, or, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One of Israel. Indeed, in chapter 41 and, and in verse 21, it is there that it's sort of like a challenge. I said in this section of Isaiah, we have a comparison between God and idols. And so in, in chapter 41 and verse 21, he says, Present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reason, says the king of Jacob. In other words, if you really believe that, that man is, is smart enough to, to be his own guide and that you do not need to serve the Lord God, then present your case. Let me hear from you. If you really think man is that smart, Back in verses 22 through 24, he says, Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things what they were, that we may consider them and, and know the latter end of them, or, or declare to us things to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Yes, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and see it together. Indeed, you are nothing and your work is nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. And that's the first challenge to those who would serve idols. Then let the idol tell us what's about to happen. They say nothing. Chapter 42 and verse 9. God says new things I declare before they spring forth I tell you of them. I'm convinced and I often tell people who doubt whether the Bible is really of God. I start by saying have you ever thought about fulfilled prophecy? How could anyone have guessed 700 years before that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And yet in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, the prophet of God declared and called it by name. Mary and Joseph lived in Nazareth. And, and who would have guessed that, that at the right month that she is to give birth, they have to come down to Bethlehem? Because the Caesar has ordained that there be a census taken at that time. And even Herod, the king of the Jews, had delayed. He didn't do it immediately because the Jews certainly didn't want to follow what the Romans wanted. They detested this, but they had to do it. And it, it just so happened that the very time that Joseph and Mary had to come to the, the city of David, for they were David's lineage, that it's at that time that Jesus is born. Who could have guessed that 700 years earlier? Fulfill prophecies by God. And in fact, that's what he's saying. Before they spring forth, I tell you. And as I've said, even Isaiah itself is just filled with prophecy after prophecy after prophecy quoted in the New Testament and fulfilled as coming to pass. But you look over chapter 44, and there in verses, really verses 13 through 17, you sort of see where, where God or Isaiah, with God's inspiration, says, Now, look at the foolishness of man who wants to serve idols. What is an idol? It's something built by man, but it's less than man. And man would build it and they'd bow down to it. I'm beginning in verse 13 of chapter 44, where it says, The craftsman stretches out his rule. He marks one out with chalk. He fastens it with a plane. He marks it out with the compass and, and makes it like the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man that it may remain in the house. He cuts down cedars for himself and takes the cypress and the oak he secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine and the rain nourishes it. In other words, he's getting it all ready, getting the right trees or for whatever. But verse 15, then it should be for a man to burn. He will take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it, bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it a carved image and falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire. With this half, he eats meat. He roasts a roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, Ah, oh, I am warm. I've seen the fire. And the rest of it? <laughs> he makes it into a god. His carved image. He falls down before it and worships it, prays to it, says, Deliver me, for you are my God. What a foolish man. The same tree, half of it, he bakes his food, warms himself. The other half of it, he worships. How foolish. In our generation, do we really worship gods? You know, the very thing that we can develop and do, and, oh, you say, well, we don't make an idol like that. I mean, we don't make a carved image, and we don't overlay with silver or gold. We, we don't do that. We may not. 
But I dare say there are people who are into idolatry. If I were to tell you about some football team, there are some people who could name every person going to play and what the schedule is and what they did last year and and they spend so much money to be involved, you know. And it may not be football. It may be something else. Maybe it's with the music industry or business or what is it that is so important to you that's more important than anything else that demands your time and your thought and your attention its first place in your heart. In effect, that becomes an idol. In Isaiah's day, he's saying, are you really comparing God to that? How foolish to turn away from God. In fact, think of how high and mighty God really is. Back in chapter 40. Look at verse 26 in chapter 40. Where there he says, Lift up your eyes on high, and see who has created these things, who brings out their hosts by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and, and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. Now, throughout Isaiah, some 62 times, in fact, God is called the, the, the Lord of hosts. And the word hosts sometimes simply speaks about the military might. Sometimes the hosts is descriptive of the angels of heaven. But in this passage, and certainly by its context, and with the parallel in, in Psalm 147, he speaks of the hosts as the stars of heaven. And so here is a challenge. Lift up your eyes and see who's created these. Have you ever gone out on a night where maybe there's no lights around and you just looked up in the sky and looked at the stars? About 3,000 stars, it said. You could see with the naked eye if you've ever tried to count them. About 3,000. And God calls them all by name. That's pretty significant in and of itself, isn't it? However, in the 1600s, Galileo made a telescope. And as he looked up in the sky, he found something like 10 times what the naked eye can see. Oh, there's something like 30,000 stars. That's significant, isn't it? Until in the 1800s, Sir William Herschel invented a telescope that made Galileo's telescope uh, look like a play toy. Instead of 30,000, he found out there was something like 26 million stars. Wow. And God knows them all. Calls them by name until the Hubble telescope was made, our generation of time. And the Hubble telescope now says that there are millions of galaxies like our Milky Way. Billions of stars. Now think about that for a moment. When the psalmist in Psalm 147 and verse 4 says he he counts the number of stars. He calls them all by name. Can you see where Isaiah is going to in this? Get on the highest mountain and shout as loud as you can. Behold the Lord God. He is able to accomplish his purpose. His plan. Always has and will. In fact, when you think about the Lord God, why would anybody question? Is my way hidden from God? In fact, as you continue in this chapter, you, you see where in verse 27 he says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and, and my just claim is passed over by my God. And in fact, what he's saying at that point in time, probably to the, to the people who are now going to be in Babylonian captivity, or Isaiah in the last 27 chapters of his prophecy, speaks about the Babylonian and, and the period of time, and even names Cyrus later as the one who will overthrow Babylon. But it is here where those who have been in Babylon may begin to question, has God forgotten about us? Have you ever felt that maybe God has forgotten about you? It is true that our lives are filled with various troubles. It is true that every one of us in our pilgrimage on the way to heaven have had some problems along the way. Maybe even now your heart is heavy because maybe there's been a death of a loved one. Or maybe you yourself are facing some kind of financial trouble or health trouble. Or maybe there's some friend or former friend who now is at house with you. Or You know, there are a lot of different ways. As, as in Job 14 and verse 1, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. 
And all of us along our pilgrimage indeed know troubles and sorrows and trials. And there may be times where we wonder, is God really concerned about me? Does God really know what's going on in my life? And it is here where Isaiah again then begins to speak words of comfort. This section is words of comfort to his people and they're still living and active even in our own time. I tell you, to the man who does not have God as his strength, indeed that is the kind of man whose life is hopeless. For trial and trouble will drive away hope. Only because God is there do we walk with a sense of well-being and a peace that surpasseth understanding. Only because we understand who God really is as the creator of heaven and earth and the one who promises to sustain us when we truly understand and by faith serve Him, we can shout and we can hold our heads up high because it is the Lord God whom we serve. Either there is no God anywhere or God is everywhere. There is no middle ground to that. The fact is that, that either this world is without hope, without meaning, without purpose, without destiny, or else it is our Father's house. God is in charge, and He keeps watch over His own. Which way is it with you? Isaiah would say, trust in the Lord. Have you not heard? In verse 28, he continues with a question. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God of the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk it and not faint. I like it's interesting. It says even, even the youth shall faint. Verse 30. You know, the young people seem or think of themselves sometimes as being invincible. But given enough time, and even they will get tired too. And so he's addressing the young as well as the old. And all who wait on the Lord. He didn't say everybody. But those who wait on the Lord shall mount up with wings like eagles. I'll tell you a true story. It's personal. But I do not read or think about this verse, but that I remember how some years ago I was told by a fellow gospel preacher in East Texas who was having a class, I think they called it kind of a ladies' Bible class midweek in the morning. And he had made a list of verses to memorize. Better than you ought to do that yourself. Make a list and work at memorizing. Your heart filled with good verses. Well, on that list was Isaiah 40, verse 31. But one of the women in that class had a sister who lived in Houston, Texas, who had also gotten the list, and she had just recently memorized this verse. When shopping one day, a thief came along and snatched her purse and ran off down the way. Well, adrenaline set in on her. And she started in chasing that thief. And she had this verse in her mind. And you know, eagles have wings and wings have feathers. And she got it all mixed up. And her shout to the thief, I've got feathers. <laughs> Said the thief stopped and looked around and dropped her purse. <laughs> Said she didn't know whether he thought she had a disease or what. <laughs> but she got her purse back. <laughs> But you know, there's more to that verse than that. It's a figure. It's an illustration. As the eagle is strong, the prince of the sky. So it is that there was this ability to say, God will bless, will lift you up. God will help you. Don't think he's forgotten about you. As 2 Timothy 2 and verse 19, the Lord knows those who are his. In Revelation chapter 7, Again in chapter 14, he describes the 144,000 as those who have the seal of God on their forehead. It's as though to say God knows every single one, the poor widow, as well as the prophet of Isaiah, or you just named whoever you might think, is a great man of faith. God knows all. And he cares for all. And therefore it is his desire that, that, that there will be strength there are no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But with every temptation, 
He also provides a way of escape. He also has promised to come and to be able to help and to aid through us. That doesn't mean there's heaven on earth. God didn't promise that he builds a wall around us and, and you'll never have a trouble. In fact, all who live godly in Christ, Jesus shall suffer persecution. But I want to tell you there is a peace that surpasses understanding because the Christian sees beyond. One thing you cannot take away from the Christian is that anchor of the soul, hope. And no matter what comes his way, he understands something beyond the now. He understands something about the now after. Why do we come to assemblies like this and sing praises unto God? Because through Jesus Christ, we have hope. By grace through faith in Him, born again, renewed in spirit, known that we are in the very image of God, so it is that God has promised to bless each one who serves Him with heaven, heaven eternal in its very nature. And as you read passages like in Revelation chapter 7, the last three or four verses, or in Revelation chapter 21, it's a place where there will be no pain, there will be no hunger, there will be no tears, there will be no death to be with God in His light. What a wonderful place. And you ought to stop and think about heaven. What's it like? Is that really your desire? Do you really want to go there? Actually, what he says in here that God gives strength to the to the weak that without him even the youth grow tired. And like a shepherd, as we illustrated back earlier in verse 11, as a shepherd he gathers his sheep or his little lambs, those who are, who are defenseless into his arms. So the picture of God himself. Those who wait on the Lord, though, are the ones who shall renew their strength. What does it really say to wait on the Lord? In your own mind, what does that really mean to you? Are you waiting on the Lord? Well, there are many passages in the Bible that speak about waiting on Him. But it's much more than just saying, okay, I've got folded arm, I'm going to pause, and I'll just sit back and wait for God. It, it, that's really the wrong meaning. There are times where there needs to be some patience, and there will be times where we need to hold back. But also the Scripture tells us and defines waiting on the Lord for us. Passages like in Psalm 25, verses 3 to 5. You have your Bible? The psalmist there defines waiting in this description. Indeed, let no one who waits on, on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. In verse 4, show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. I want you to notice that. What the psalmist says to the Lord, show me, teach me, lead me. It's an attitude. It's an attitude that, Lord, if you will just teach me what is right, show me and teach me, I will do it. I'll obey. It's the attitude, I'm here as your servant, Lord, to follow you. You understand that. If you go into a restaurant and a waiter comes up, now, what's he there for? Well, I'm going to tell you what. I, I, I think I want a hamburger and a milkshake. And the waiter goes back in the kitchen. 30 minutes pass. You don't have any hamburger or milkshake. You begin to wonder. If you stay, an hour passes and finally he comes out. And already you're probably upset. It didn't take that long. But instead of a hamburger and a milkshake, he brings you fruit juice and a vegetable plate. And you say, wait a minute, this is not what I ordered. And the waiter says, well, I know, but says, you know, that's, that milkshake's not good for you. Got all that sugar in it? And, and that hamburger has that fat in it? That's not healthy food. This fruit juice and this vegetable plate is much better for you. Well, do you say? If you hadn't already gotten up and left, you certainly aren't happy with him changing what you ordered, are you? Do we do God that way sometimes? Do we, instead of waiting on the Lord, make the Lord wait on us? Lord, I intend to obey you sometime later. I really want to go to heaven, Lord. Later. How many of us really have the attitude, if the Lord said it, that's what I'll do. And I'm not going to wait later. I'm going to obey. Just show me. 
Teach me. Lead me. And I'll do your will. That's really the attitude of the kind of individual who is waiting on the Lord. Indeed, what do you believe about God? Are you really the kind of individual that has given your life to Him? In Psalm 62 and verse 1, the psalmist said, Truly my soul silently waits for God. From Him comes my salvation. And in verse 5 of Psalm 62, My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from Him. I especially like that verse. My expectation is from Him. What are you looking for? What is your expectation? What is of most importance to you? And you say, serving God, I know all things are going to be well. Putting Him first in my life. Indeed, He'll bless and protect. Even as He blessed His people of the past, we read there are times where God's people were taken into captivity because they didn't wait on God. But those who did wait on Him were always blessed and protected by Him. Now, how about you? We're going to sing this song we call an invitation song. And if you're not ready for the Lord to come, if you're not ready for the judgment day, it's time for you to make a decision. And you can make it now in the presence of these friends. Say, I believe Jesus to be the Son of God. I'm wanting to live for Him. Repenting of my sins. I'm going to try to live as if Christ were walking at my side every day. The way I dress, the words I speak, the kind of friends I have, the places I go. I would not be ashamed if Jesus were walking right beside me. Is that your lifestyle? If it hasn't been, if you've brought reproach upon the Christ and upon His work, then why not repent and come back to the Lord? But if you've never joined the Lord, you've never be become a Christian, why not this hour? Waiting on the Lord, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith, why not be baptized into His death that His blood may wash away <coughs> your sins? If you're subject to that invitation, we bid you come right now as we stand. Promise.